So, so uh, we, we had our year's water supply over the weekend. <laughs> and now we have, we don't know how long we'll wait until the next bit. Uh, it's great to see you, see you all. Uh, our speaker today is Jack Schultz, who's, who's spent, uh, I don't know, part of vocation, part of application you know, as an engineer, looking at water systems in Iran and, and around the world, just uh, having a discussion today about kind of what is the future, what are the alternatives, what, what, what's, the, uh, what's the buffet of things we can do to assure water supply over the coming years. And as Jack notes, uh, it's, it's kind of entwined with energy because, you know, it, it wants to be salvation or what things require energy, but the more energy we use, particularly fossil sources, then the, the more unpredictable the climate becomes. So we've got, it's not a, not a simple deal, and it probably makes sense for uh, all of us to a bit better understand it. So uh, this is going to be kind of a discussion format. Uh, Jack's going to kick us off. He said that if you have questions along the way, feel free to, uh, to ask them. And uh, uh, this is a thirsty group, so uh, we'll see. Yes, see, how, uh, <laughs> see how it goes. Jack, thank you very much. Thank you. Peter, I understand. I feel more comfortable while we're standing. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me just, uh, I'll sit back here. Just in the habit, I can pace when I get nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, my name is Jack Schultz, as Peter said. Uh, I'm currently a civil engineer and do all kinds of things here in Santa Cruz. So general civil engineering, though I've lately for quite a while I've been because of our serious water problems, I've begun to try to emphasize water. I've made several water systems that uh, for residential uses using uh, rainwater. Uh, my credentials I, we can talk about later. I, I'm a licensed civil engineer and, and licensed mechanical engineer. And many years ago, for about 10 years, I was a physicist. And much longer than that, I'm a general contractor. So, I'd like to emphasize the idea of sustainability. I'll probably go through the outline and maybe we can get some questions. Sustainability is not quite as simple to describe as to understand as you might think. Obviously, we're talking about water or anything, panels, whatever. They all take energy to operate, takes energy to build them, and a great deal of energy to transport them. I wouldn't be surprised if the energy required to transport the piano if it came from Europe, but that might have, uh, might be almost half as much as the energy required to build it. So transportation is going to be a transportation energy cost is going to be very high. Well, you say, what does all of us have to do with water? Well, in my view, it's, it's sort of, it's not quite a good metaphor, but it's something like the complementariness of wave and particle descriptions of light. Water and energy are interchangeable in the sense that if you run short of one, you're going to be short of the other. And you can't substitute and just say, that I'll just, if I don't have enough energy, I'll get a bigger hydraulic plant. If I don't have enough water, I'll have desalination. It's not quite that simple. So sustainability then would be, I've already mentioned the obvious thing, the energy to operate, to catch, to make water, or to make electricity. And there's also the energy to manufacture the plant, what kind of equipment it takes. If you drill a hole in the ground and, and uh, make a well, it's a one-time investment of, of energy as long as it stays deep enough. And then you have the operation of the pump and so on. Many things, the embodied energy is enough. By embodied energy, that's a general term for the amount of energy it takes to manufacture something. Many times that's almost as great as the, as the operational energy or, or greater. So it's like a, a making a building, a capital investment. It's outweighed many times by the operation, that's the other way around, by the operation costs. So there's a third component. It's one that I really can't say anything at all definitive about. I think it's almost the most important one. Let's suppose we we're talking about a water supply. I'm going to mention what kinds of water supplies we have and so on. But suppose we're talking about a water supply and we can calculate how much energy it takes to produce, calculate how much energy it takes to manufacture the equipment. Those things are well known, I don't remember all the numbers, but they're there. There is an intangible, and our society is going to have to face it. I don't, if I knew how to do it, I would give a figure of merit of how much embodied energy there is in the technical operation of a gadget. Let's say a reverse osmosis plant. The first osmosis plant is a fairly 
technically demanding piece of equipment. They work well, but it takes a fairly highly trained person. And if you use the old rubric that 10,000 hours of practice become an expert, should we count all the energy that it takes to rear a child old enough to go to college and then allow 10,000 more hours of, to support him or her while he's learning his, his or her trade or, or her profession? How do we decide how much energy for the human part of any form of water or, or energy production? The one thing that occurs to me about it is that I happen to be a believer in almost the Grecian ideal of simplicity. If you're going to have something sustainable, the simpler it can be and the less uh, technical expertise required to operate it, the more sustainable. The reason I say that is suppose you need, you have a wonderful piece of very efficient equipment and the only people who are trained to operate it have to go to school for 12 years before they come. And it takes one every four, it takes two people every four hours. <coughs> Think of the investment by society in all those people. That's part of the energy. And that part, I think, could be calculated and make some assumptions. But the part that's hard for me to decide is this. How much do you allow for the social value of someone having a job? <laughs> Let's assume somehow we have a guaranteed annual income. So no one actually had to work. In my opinion, most people like to work, like to produce something. They don't like to work the way they do now, but they certainly like to work. So if you build a, an efficient device that meets all the other criteria I mentioned, and it puts someone out of work, and he or she is now getting a guaranteed in, in, income, how happy or unhappy will that be as a contribution to society? I don't know how to answer that question, but I think we need to face it. We're now reaching a point where we've already reached a point a long time ago where at least in this country we can produce more goods and products than we really need people to do. So we are, it's not an unemployment problem like we've got to somehow produce jobs. The jobs aren't there. We can give everybody everything they need with much less work. Uh, years ago David Reason pointed out that someday we would consider it a privilege to be allowed to work. Um, that's, that's a background for what sustainability might be. And let me just mention, since we're talking about water, water and energy, we can interchange. Ultimately, of course, all the energy comes from the sun. Uh, water comes from rainfall. Uh, all of our water comes from rainfall. And that's produced by temperature differences caused by solar energy. And of course, you, we all are familiar with collecting solar energy and photovoltaic panels. There are other ways to do it which are more efficient, but that's one. Plants are fairly efficient at collecting photovoltaic en uh, energy from the sun. The question here is, is uh, when you have a source, how do you make, how do you produce the water? I'm going to speak as if rainfall were quite separate from solar energy. We have enough rainfall here in Santa Cruz, far more than we need for not only this population, but other than quite the expanded population, which I'm not in favor, but we could do it. Most people who are familiar with the changes of climate, they debate fiercely about all kinds of details, and I'm certainly not an expert. But there seems to be a general consensus that whatever way we go, however soon it happens, the Southwest is going to get drier and hotter, and the Northwest is going to get wetter, Cold. That's generally accepted. That we don't know the detail. We know that's going to happen. We, however, here in Central Valley are in a transition zone. It's going to get wetter here or drier, hotter or colder. I, I personally believe the most likely thing, and it's not just my personal opinion, but is that there will be greater extremes. We'll have longer time between heavier rains, which requires a very different kind of infrastructure. Um, as an engineer, many times I've had to design things that involve gutters. Now, gutters are usually considered an afterthought in buildings here in Santa Cruz. It's just a small detail that you have to do. Actually, gutters are almost always under-designed to take the amount of rain and fall we're going to have. And there's a reason for gutters. It's not just because you want to keep it from dripping off your roof. If you don't have gutters and you don't convey it somewhere, you're putting water right at the foundation of your house. 
which reduces the longevity of the house, almost any kind of house. So, you have the rainfall. We're going to have it. But if we have that much rainfall, we can't use it all at once. The San Lorenzo River burns us during the wintertime and makes far more water than we need. We get most of our water from the San Lorenzo, almost all of it here in the Santa Cruz. Swallows them out from a couple of creeks up north and a couple of small wells. But it's almost all from the river. And there's all this, quote, wasted, unwasted water going out the ocean during the wintertime. If we had a place to store it, then we could easily meet our needs and other people's needs. We could accommodate droughts and all kinds of things. However, the water is turbid. When, when it's raining hard, it's muddy. Fancy word for turbid. And since it's muddy, you've got to get rid of the mud before you treat the water otherwise. That's not an insuperable problem, but it gives me a chance to talk about the mention, the political dimension to it. As you're aware of the many things that we do, there's a lot of resistance to change. A lot of resistance. There are many places in the country that use far muddier water than we do, and the technology is well known, but it hasn't been used here because we only collected water in the summertime from underground sources, underground near the, the river, so they haven't had to worry about today. They don't, it's not that expensive, but it requires a, a change in thinking. And that's probably the hardest kind of change of all, a change in attitudes on, a, on a, not only a governmental place, I'm not going to government, but in the general public has to understand and pay for these things. So uh, we, if we have a source, mainly rainfall, the next problem is storage, which where would you store water? You can build tanks. There used to be a very big one right down here near the university. Uh, that tank, which seemed, I forgot what it was, sorry, we didn't get on something like that. That was a small amount. It would not be any use really to carry you through a drought. It was a good tank, it served its purpose. But the amount of water you need to store is the, the biggest obstacle to using rainfall. Almost all of us have roofs, I can tell you, even when we have a erratic rain that goes a long time without much, Almost all of you have roofs large enough so that you collect the water on it is far more than your needs for the whole year. There's that much water there. Occasionally you'll see somebody put a 50 gallon barrel on, they don't quite realize it fills up in 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as it rains, that's, that's <laughs> if you have adequate, if you have adequate uh, gutters and leaders, which we often don't. So we have storage, we can do it in tanks, we can do it in reservoirs. Now, we do have one big reservoir here, which we rely on heavily. I was around on the board of water, water board a long time ago, and it's clear, clear that we will never build another reservoir in this area unless something changes that I can't imagine. There are a couple of possible places we could build a dam and build a reservoir, but I probably don't need to spell out this room what the difficulties are and the, the objections there are to building the reservoirs, quite apart from cost. Yes? I've only been here for 25 years, and I'd like to know, what is this huge resistance to building the reservoir? Well, one, it, they're expensive. Yeah. You have to displace a, a lot of people. And from my standpoint, or engineering standpoint, when you build a reservoir, the biggest loss is evaporation. You store all that water there, and you evaporate it, and reservoirs fill up with silt. And to my knowledge, no one has solved the problem uh, on a cost-effective basis of desilting large reservoirs. They build big, wonderful dams that work just the way they're supposed to, and in 50 years, which is long, not very long in our time, in 50 years they fill up with silt, can't use it. Oh, they look what's happening to the like me. One of the biggest dams, best dams in the world. And it's in serious trouble because of filling. It has less volume now. I remember right somewhere it has half the volume available that it, used, that it was designed for. Now that's only in 70, I remember that room. That's in 70 years. And that was probably the best dam in the world for that purpose. Uh, the other possibility, and the one of course I'd like to push because I think it's the simplest, the other possibility is. Uh, underground aquifers. Now we talk about, we, I mean, people know that you can drill a well on the 
ground in many places. Uh, there are very many places you can hit water, pump it out, and get the water supply. It's a big political social problem that people feel they can do that. It's my land, I'm going to drill well for it, and I'll pay for it, and I'll run the pump. Who else has anything to say about it? But it's like the tragedy of the commons. These aquifers that I can pump and drill, actually I have a little pump, a well pump. Um, these aquifers belong to everybody. If I draw it down here, someone miles away is going to be short of water if I draw it too far. And that, I'm sure you've read about the kinds of things that are happening in the Southwest and Arizona and so on. It's, it's very serious. Eventually they're going to be uninhabitable because they've drained their reservoirs. We do not know exactly how large the aquifers are here in Santa Cruz County. We do know they've been heavily depleted. Uh, we have not reached the point where the wells, many wells fail, but wells do, mostly small residential wells, are failing because the water levels drop. Um, one possibility, which you probably all read of, and I'd like to hope it happened politically, is that we could take that excess water that I spoke about from the San Lorenzo River, purify it in the wintertime, and send it to a place like Soquel, who will rapidly pulling down their aquifers, and they are almost completely dependent on, on aquifers. Actually, we, common term is infiltration. When it rains, uh, grass, uh, grassland, something like 30% of the rain, that doesn't sound like very much, but it's a lot, infills the ground goes into the aquifer. But if you build a, a house or a street, that water doesn't infiltrate. And you can't just dump it into a little hole somewhere because the ground won't absorb it that quickly. There's another difficulty with letting stormwater run off like that when you pave everything, when you have impermeable surfaces. And that is the difficulty is that we may not realize how much money is spent in collecting stormwater under, during our rare storms, treating it and putting it in the ocean. It has to be treated and almost costs, costs about half as much to treat stormwater, which we never use for anything, as it does to treat the drinking water. It's people don't realize it. So if we could cut down the amount of stormwater, if we could somehow collect our rainfall, if we had a way to store it, then we would, we would reduce the social cost of storm, storm drains, which are very, very high. And we, as long as we'd have a kind of emergency supply, if you will. If we keep going where we are, what happens when the aquifer gets down too low? All of a sudden, people say, well, dig, uh, dig a deeper well. That happened in Iran. I was there a short time looking at water things. And they were there in the desert, surrounded by mountains, and all their water comes from mountains just as ours does. And they had, with the advent of efficient wells, well pumps, people would drill them as deep as they want, and all the water in the world, the aquifer goes down. At some point, the energy required to drill a deeper well and the energy required to pump it back up starts to be uh, in, in, impossible, depending on what the energy source is. Um, so we have supply of rainfall. There's another kind of supply, you know, we can desalinate seawater. That's certainly possible. I happen to be lucky enough to be involved in the early parts of that. Uh, reverse osmosis, for instance, works, works quite well. However, I do not think we should employ it at all. It's a very high-tech kind of manufacturing thing. It depends on a very high-quality manufacturing process, which I don't even know where they take, certainly we're within 100 miles of here. And if you add in transportation costs, and you add it quite apart from energy, it is not energy efficient. We all know that. But in addition, it requires just highly trained tra technicians and a lot of transportation to bring the necessary parts from wherever they make them. Uh, there may be some little gap in a spring in one of the pumps they use. It's only manufactured in, in, in Iowa somewhere. Probably costs 50 cents. If there's an interruption in the supply chain, and those springs are essential, there's some kinds of gadgets that you, even good innovative mechanics, can't, I can't manufacture a spring very well. I can manufacture all kinds of things. I just couldn't do it very well in my backyard shop. It can be done, but it would be very, very inefficient. I might not be able to get it right. 
they have to be described. Now, when I talk about a spring, I'm, I'm using that as an example of how vulnerable and how interdependent we are as a sort of a pitch for us be trying to develop a sustainable water supply so we aren't dependent on transportation from listed distant places. In our case, we probably wouldn't mind so much if we depend on highly trained personnel since we have a lot of people like that. But as far as transportation and other supplies, we, we are dependent. And I'll just mention uh, the power part of it. I won't belabor the quite problem with crude oil and gas. We can probably all read enough more than you want to know about that. We start here depleting those supplies, they're going to go down. And even if they were inexhaustible, the amount of pollution that carbon, that uh, stored carbon in the form of fossil fuels, that amount of pollution contribute, we know contributes to climate change. And even if it did not contribute to climate change, it pollutes where you are. And it costs a lot of money to get rid of pollution. How much money, when they talk about carbon footprint of a gallon of gasoline, there are all kinds of numbers about how, what, how much is officially used in the marine <coughs> car and how it's not. How do you add in the, the, the degree of grumpy ecstasis that comes in small numbers throughout the whole population? That, that should be that part of the cost of reducing the quality of someone's life because they're inhaling a certain kind of pollutant. It doesn't affect most of us, but there's a big enough percentage who are affected by pollution that it's, it's, it costs. We pay for it. Um, now we get so I've got the one desalination by reverse osmosis is probably the most practical. It can be done by boiling, which is less efficient even than reverse osmosis. The heat of vaporization is sort of high, and you just really eat very efficient uh, flash distillation plants like they have on ships. They use the waste heat from the engines. Even they are not very efficient. They, they're efficient because they use stuff that would other, heat that would otherwise be thrown away. But we don't produce that much heat. Um, so we have rainfall, we have desalination. I really don't think there's much else or any other way to think about it. There is a question, and then I'll stop at this and see if there are questions. We've talked about supplies and rainfall ultimately. Secondly, where are we going to store it so we can use it? And thirdly, how do we make it so drinkable? Um, there are many ways to do this. The most common and the most efficient way to do it is to use chlorine. A lot of us probably don't like that idea. You to taste in the, you don't actually taste the chlorine. You taste the chlorine uh, residual compound, but it tastes bad anyhow. Chlorine works wonderfully. It's a, probably an enhanced the life of people worldwide. So I don't want to put it down. But it comes from somewhere. You can make it on site, and many big plants do. But that takes a lot of energy. So you can't, you can't get it for nothing. What I happen to prefer for small systems is uh, ultraviolet disinfection. This is just a tube that water passes through. And ultraviolet, the kind of light that looks purple, and you really can't see the strongest part of it at all unless you look at it in your eyes. Sort of like coming from the, what you see the spark from an arc welder. That's the ultraviolet we're talking about. And it's a very efficient uh, disinfection device. If the water's clear going in, it can't be turbid because that, each little particle would block the other particles from, it, it shades them. So, a system that I've designed lately for drinking, uh, have filtration so that the ultraviolet will work. You don't really need that high filtration for people to drink. You wouldn't you wouldn't notice the difference between ordinary levels of disinfection. But the ultraviolet plant does. Uh, so to sum up, to be sustainable, we have to think about the energy involved in the man in the equipment necessary to make it. Even drilling a hole in the ground and having pipes throughout the city takes a lot of energy. Then we have to take the energy to operate it. And we have to take the social cost of removing people from the workforce and supporting them anyhow. I think that's probably what I had to say about it. And there's all kinds of details, and I'll try to remember some of them. Yes? Did you say why not to put water in the aquifer? Oh, we should put water in the aquifer. Oh, I didn't touch <laughs> that. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, I meant to. That's a very important point. Could you repeat the question for that? Oh, yes. The question is, why not put water in the ark? I, I, I prefer, actually, I forgot to use something. I'm working on very hard right now. <laughs> if it's just simply a matter of taking water from the surface or rainfall, and you can't put it in the ground. You don't want to pollute your aquifer because water from the roof is usually quite clean. Water from the street is not. It's not impossible, but it, it takes a lot of energy to clean it well enough to be allowed to direct, uh, inject it in the ground. It's somewhat the thing you hear about fracking. Uh, the fracking itself, the extraction of gas, doesn't do much damage. It's re-injecting re the the smelt water, they use a lot of water in the process. That's what does the damage. So we have to be very careful about how we re-inject or we inject uh, water into that. But there are ways of doing it. And I'm working on right now, I happen to be a Quaker. And I thought there are people into paying, and this is a community service, paying for a, uh, a test drill in our parking lot with the idea that it's a matter of good stewardship of the Quakers. As citizens, we have rain falling on our property, we ought to do something with it instead of just putting it in the storm drain, which is what we do now, like everyone else does, have a large parking lot. Well, we drill in, we expect it. In this area, there's an aquifer called the Santa Margarita. Many of the wells, almost all the wells for Soquel, are in that, in that aquifer. You need one that is not, that water can travel through, so that we, it, it conducts water easily. It can't be impermeable. Like much of what you see on the ground is almost like clay. It's very close to being uh, waterproof. So you can't get water. You can't put, a, can't put it there. You have to put it in the Santa Margarita. Well, it just so happens since nobody has any wells in the eastern part of Santa Cruz, because they all have municipal water, there was no data. And a guy in uh, UCSC, Andy Fisher, who's done a great job examining the whole county and finding out where, what places are good for recharging the aquifer, and I'll go into why in a moment. He had a whole he had to just extrapolate for two or three miles with no data. Did the best he could, as we expected when we drilled this, that it would be a waste of money in the sense of helping the Quakers. Well, we didn't need to do anything about our water anyhow, it ran really good. We probably paid for it with our property. Well, churches don't pay property taxes. So we didn't even pay for it. But it turned out that the Santa Margarita was right in these underground strata, and here's on top, here's the ground, and on top is pure smoke, which is impermeable, it's like clay. Below that is a sandy area that goes all the way out the ocean, that's the Santa Margarita. It, it has enough, I can't find anybody who knows how much, but there's no doubt it has enough capacity to store an awful lot of water. So it turned out that we thought the Santa Margarita was going to be 50 to 100 feet down, we have to go through this permeable layer, and that's very expensive to put the water in there. Again, I mean, not expensive to drill through it, but you've got to get the water in there. Turned out Santa Margarita comes to the surface. For a very long area there, it's the Santa Margarita is only eight feet below ground. So it turns out that rather than an expensive filtration pumping process, we can dig trenches with perforated pipes in them gravel, exactly the same as the kind of leach lines you use for septic system. And we can use all that water. I'm in the process of doing the plans for the Quakers to um, try to induce the other churches around. We only have 25,000 square feet, but there are two other adjacent churches. Together, we did, all three of us could put in 15 acre feet of water a year with Relatively inexpensive trenches, not big pumps, not mini pumps at all, which I, I really like not having pumps. So you can put the water in the ground through infiltration galleries. And what you do, because the water's coming off the uh, parking lot, it's certainly not very great. You're not going directly in the, in the back main part of the aquifer. You want to get rid of the pollutants. And so people, this is a well-established technology now. People make what are called rain gardens. Um, plants that sequester the pollutants and make a kind of natural filtration. They're on the top and underneath there's some dirt and gravel and the Supposedly the water then goes in the ground underneath, if it's the right kind of ground, and it is here. Um, my concern with the meeting, the quicker meeting, if we make this trench in the rain garden, uh, there's one downtown right behind the uh, uh, 
because I have a building. It's just the curb, cars can bump up against it, and in between is the structures, things growing. Problem is that if we're trying to store water for a 10 month drought, maybe 11 months, there are plants that the plants have to be able to stand being flooded because when it rains real hard, they, they'll be wet. And then they have to be able to live 11 months without water. And the kind of, there are plants that will do that, but they're really pretty ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and they look ugly in some way. So what I'm proposing for the meeting, if we get the funding, I'm sure we'll do it. Our, our reason for doing it ourselves so much as, a, as an example, because there are a lot of churches in town. I'm going to um, collect rainfall from our church building and store it, provide enough water to keep a decent kind of book garden alive during the summer so that it'll be ready for when the winter comes with this heavy rain. So we can do it. We could build very expensive filtration equipment if the, if the parish had been there and use high pressure pumps to put it down the ground, which you can see why that's probably not practical of, of financially. But the rain garden is probably quite practical. Yeah. So a question related to that. I, I read, and I wonder if I write about this, that uh, San Jose uses a lot of its water to go to these percolation ponds, which are for that purpose. I, in fact, that much of the Lexington Reservoir water ultimately is released into these perk ponds. Is, is that correct, and could we do similar things? We do, and actually it's part of our building code here in this county. We build large buildings are required to you build percolation ponds like that. The ones that we have here, I, I'm familiar with ones in, in San Jose, and they really need them, they use them. Most, if they're shallow, that means they, they, do, they do their job, but now you, you've uh, dedicated a large expense. Yeah, how big are they in San Jose? Well, and the, I don't know how big they are in San Jose, but I know how much can percolate per square foot. Yeah. And it's only three or four feet deep to start with. It won't last. Let's just take one square feet, no matter how, many, how large it is. How much, how long will it take for a column of water, one square foot, to percolate through the bottom of it? Mm -hmm. Even as well designed, it's not going to last 11 months, unless it's quite deep. That's one of the reasons the election reservoir works so well, it's quite deep. The ratio of volume stored to the surface area is pretty good. It does, when it gets really full, it spreads out, and that probably doesn't apply anymore. But as soon as it starts to go down, and you may not know them, Lexington Reservoir, they pump in and out of it to try to heat the level on such a level so the evaporation is not too great. Uh, the percolation ponds, which are in the building code, and you're supposed to build them, and there are all kinds of waivers to get around, it, which people do. Uh, they, there are two things about them. They build a lot of money, they spend a lot of money on rain garden and find out that we fill up the aquifer right away. <laughs> I don't think that'll happen, but and it is good to have them. Yeah, you can't do anything without data. The information is, is what's helpful, right? The, the information, is. yes. Yeah, okay. Is that important if, if my own water system, I illustrate a couple of problems, but those are So, So we've got uh, 33 acres of gophers and redwoods just past Dale Bay and Golf Course. Yeah. And there's two wells, and a spring is actually the main source of water on that property. The spring was apparently Dale Bay's original source. It's been running for a couple hundred years. And it's the best water quality. So this this water comes through a, almost like an underground cave, gets goes into a tank, we pump it up, you know, filter and stuff like that. But the excess flows over down the hill through redwoods into a fern garden into kind of like a seasonal stream that, that's there. So the two issues is one is that just yesterday I got a note from one of the San Francisco district saying we're here to help you. Uh, and, and having had experience with fish and game helping us turn a emergency fire road culvert from 12,000 to 200,000, I probably don't want their help. <laughs> and um, 12,000 to 200,000 what? Well, so, so the other one an emergency fire exit that got us to another road that was, that was just a normal culvert that after 50 years busted out. It's just to replace the culvert. And put a head wall in front and make it better, make it a larger culvert, would be about $12,000 if done properly. But this, 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 this seasonal stream, which is completely dry in the summer, has these like 12 foot drops. And apparently there are, are salmon in Olympic training to, <laughs> to make their way back up there, going through probably a dozen other culverts before they get to us. But they wanted to be really sure that our culvert, instead of a culvert, 
was basically a huge concrete square uh, thing that would allow salmon, after having high jumped and pole vaulted, <laughs> to about two miles back to get. So I guess I got to two hundred thousand. Thousand uh, dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's and, right. And and so I got the point. So that that is what? <laughs> while I'm somewhat of a communitarian. Um, Probably not with with the official level of Santa Cruz County. So, <laughs> so, so, so there's this one issue of uh, I'd really like to do what's sustainable by myself. <laughs> and, and, and so the next issue is so this spring is here. Uh, it kind of recharges the well here down. We want to go through firm ground and stuff. But in the winter when we have like the Gulf, so this this seasonal street which is virtually bone dry uh, turns into a gusher with five feet of water. It's carved with this deep kind of area, you know, that makes high jump for fish and stuff like that. They've never been there in the last 200 years um, uh, along the way. So there's an opportunity, perhaps, to, to do something with that one that I have no idea about. Well, not having seen it, but I can give a general idea. Since, it, apart from the rainy season, you see the stream runs dry. Right. Well, that means whatever excess water is infiltrated. You've done. You've already done the job. You've right. done what you could. Uh, the question is, what do you do when it's torrential rain? Right. The best problem thing you can do is to make a various barriers to slow down the water and get a chance. To, if you were to make, let, let's say, a, I'll call it a berm. Make a berm on the contour of your land, yeah. as far down as you can, away from the stream. Give the stream a chance to do whatever it can naturally. But then you slow it down. Yeah. Rather than letting you have a, a, what you want to do is not that erosion you told about. It's a very serious problem. It, it interferes with the fish out at sea, for that matter. Uh, if you could make a series of small, you aren't going to be in the business of building big dams. Right. But you could build a series of what we call check dams. We have to swell. That's where the spur garden is. So yeah. it's kind of like that. Well, you could, you, one, one easy kind of check dam. People don't think it's even very high tech. Put a log in, draw out bushes around it, twigs, all the extra branches. That slows it down. And if you have <laughs> every, <laughs> every, 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 every 50 feet or something like that, you'd be able to slow the ground. You probably couldn't completely capture a torrential rain, yeah. but you'd get an awful lot more just, and you certainly wouldn't get the erosion. You don't want to let the water get high velocity. Yeah. That's why when you go on a trail in the mountains, a lot of you are hydrogen on it, you'll see these water bars. What they're for, it's not they care about it for any of it, is they don't want the water to accumulate on the road, get moving faster and faster so it reaches erosion speed. So they have a water bar close enough so the water is slow enough and never gets to the erosion speed. There is a speed that will remove various sides. So I'd suggest you make a series of check dams and you can do them as you go. Just whatever's on your property. I'm glad to hear that, that you've got that stream. Uh, is there been any Problem in less water in the stream during the end of the drought period. You know, um, the rainfall is so variable that I mean, it, it, uh, our spring has has been constant throughout. Now, it does go up and down in terms of volume, but it's enough to provide our household and three other households. But it does go up and down in volume. Uh, it, it it has. And we don't know about the underlying aquifer. I'm somebody's gonna put a straw in that someday and maybe you know, suck it dry. So there is that issue. But it's, it's, and I can't remember the, the exact figures I calculated, but it's long from like, a, um, you know, it's, it's fluctuated like two to one in the, in the dry season to wet season, in terms of just the, the, the excess flowing out of uh, that. Well, you, you probably can't practically as, a, as an individual afford to store that water. Right. So what you need to do is to slow it down as much as you can and give it the best chance you can to have an infiltrate. Yeah, you know, like the more you do, the better. Not a very exciting answer. It's not a hundred percent. Redwoods are great for that. Gators got some beavers. I think you should. I've lived in two places where water was important. At one, we used to have a cabin on the west branch of Soquel Creek. Yeah. Okay, and it was almost deserted. There were very few uh, places on it, but everybody got water rights. 
uh, back in the 50s, I think, or no, it was the 70s. And so I'm wondering, can people still, well, I've got a bunch of questions, but can people still uh, pull water out of the creek with those wa pull water rights? And second, a lot of the, there would be, uh, well, we have springs and so forth, but there would often be, it looked like oil or, and I, I, I know that they're, they used to think they were going to uh, take uh, oil or uh, gas out of the mountains there. There, there was a time when, and it's part of the bees. I've heard of that, yes. Yeah. And I always wonder, well, what's that orange <laughs> stuff in the water? And third, what about all the, there was, there was very little control on the septic tanks or so Well, the control on, um, let me just answer that one quickly. The, the environmental health department in Santa Cruz, in my opinion, does a good job. They, the older septic tanks are grandfathered in, but as you need to build a new septic tank, a new, a new leach line, the regulations are quite stringent and they, they really do uh, enforce them with intelligence, I should say. It's not just simply the, the art. So the new ones, if you build a new septic system, you have to build it right. The older ones, many of them did infiltrate right into the stream. Let me back up and talk about water rights. Uh, what you're referring to, probably most of you know, is that in California you have what prior appropriation rights. If a stream or a water source went through your property and you were there first and you used it, well then you had right to it indefinitely. And all of that underlying that uh, whole legislation which encouraged development in California, underlying was the assumption that the water supply was infinite. <laughs> that it wasn't a common good that there was so much water that even I took all I wanted from my ranch it would have nothing to do with how much water anybody else used. Those days are gone. We are we now need to we need to consider water rights. And the water right laws, you can imagine the kind of large interests that are really hate to have anything change, particularly agricultural interests. Uh, but it's changing. They are actually slowly moving through legislation to try to do something about the water right laws. If you have rights, if you owned that property before, I don't know, I think it's 1978 or something like that, uh, you have rights. You can take the water out of the stream and dam with your neighbor downstream. Uh, um, that seems, they try to supply, they try to keep that down, but it's actually legally possible. Uh, I, the other one I don't think I can address very well. <laughs> you mean that the, the orange and the oil. Well, the, the oil, there is natural, there are natural oil deposits here. There are actual oil wells up around Davenport somewhere. Um, and of course we have dinosaurs that all over the place. Dinosaurs <laughs> being oil in me. Uh, so there probably is oil seeping out of the ground. Uh, if you're below a, a street, a busy highway, it might become a highway. But it's more likely it's natural. Uh, I suppose our whole ecosystem grew up with natural seepages that didn't kill everything just because it was a natural oil slick. Um, you, could, you could remove it with a rain garden. Rain gardens do, there are plants that will sequester the various pollutants like oil. And they often will change them chemically so they're, they're, they're less damaging. Or they use it in their own, uh, their own metabolism. So you, it wouldn't be hard to get rid of it. Uh, the, if you're talking about small quantities for your own house, it's very easy to do. Uh, there's a kind of filtration called carbon filtration when cartridges, and it will remove all that oil very easily. And for a house, it's practical. It's not practical for a whole city. Yes. Oh, I think there's another question. Yes. Uh, I recently read that um, this rainfall that we had in parts of California it was the largest one-day rainfall since 1845. I don't know. Wasn't talking that. That's what he said. But you know, there are parts of the world where they not only don't have enough rain and they don't have enough water, they don't have enough clean water. And there's a website called charityorg.com and they claim that there are over a billion people that don't have clean water and women walk 
like eight hours a day with a jug on their head, carrying water back to their home. So, you know, compared to us, <laughs> that's a big problem. Yeah. How do you deal with that? That's my question. I hate to sound as pessimistic in this room as, as I feel. I think a lot of people are going to die in the next few decades. A lot more than just natural death. It sounds like there are people, I know what, what you're talking about. People can't sustain that for a century. You can sustain it for a few decades, but they, their children are going to grow up, not, they're not going to grow up as healthy as other people's children. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, there are a lot of people are going to die because of lack of water. And there's probably nothing we can do about it. I mean, well, it's, I mean, it's not just lack of water, it's lack of clean water. Yeah, it's not hard to get it clean, but it costs some money. It costs something. And for people who are so poor they got to carry water eight, eight hours a day, a nickel a day would be too much. Uh, so it, certainly there are easy ways to make it clean. And they're not even very expensive in our terms, but they're very expensive in terms of very poor people. And I, uh, after the tsunami in Java, Sumatra, I went with a group I was made on a the ship there for a while to deliver supplies. And I finally realized they didn't want their supplies, that they're a fisherman. When it happened, tsunami had come in and they had all these wells that were in their villages, not far above sea level, but they were freshwater wells. When the seawater came in, it filled all the wells with seawater. So the only contribution I made was to pump out the seawater. And the wells then became, took a while, they didn't get, get completely clean, but they became drinkable again. So there are things you can do, but I mean, I could boast about that, about how nice it was, but remember, I had a pump. I had electric, the electric gasoline from the pump, I had a boat to take me ashore. It was a big deal. And for, for us, it was charity, almost minuscule. But for them, it was impossible. They could not have done it. Yes? Two questions. First of all, what is actually a spring? And when how, the water that comes off of a roof is not considered gray water, is it? I'll try. I did not touch on gray water. No, it is not gray water. The water that comes off the roof, and that is one of the few uh, subjects that have been actually adequately studied scientifically. Um, the water that comes off almost any roof, even the asphalt chamber roofs, is good enough so you can easily filter and disinfect it and use it. It's not perfectly clean. Uh, it pulls pollutants out of the air, and the most the, major pollutant is when it's dry and the dust blows up on the roofs. Right. But the, it's quite clean. Gray water is a different matter. Right. Everybody gets excited about gray water and I just don't understand why. You don't use that much gray water compared to all the other uses. That number one. And secondly, gray water must be used instantly, or not should say instantly, immediately. Right. Because if you store it, it has to be treated at the same level as you would drinking water. And that's not practical in an average house. It has to be filtered, it has to be chlorinated. It's, it's, uh, gray water is very difficult. Sub, it's, gray water is not that much different from sewage. Sewage is very, I don't know how many of you had experience with it, but if you look at a, a flow of sewage from the city, it's quite clear. So, I actually have a failing well. I'm up in Okay. So, if I had rainwater from my roof and collected it, I already have a fancy uh, filtering system, including the UV and the carbon and all that stuff. In yeah. theory, it could run through there and would be fine for That's household use? Our only theory, I built people, when I just finished, one forty-two thousand gallon in Coralitos, where it's for the whole family and five acres. And the and county allows that? Yes, I have, they've allowed me to have, I think, four waivers so far. The rules, they haven't changed the county code to make it. But they, I work pretty closely with them. And they allowed me to, to design these systems. And they have various caveats and so on. But yes, you could get permission to do it. You have to work out a little bit and you have to prove you knew how to. You have to prove. The most important thing, you have to prove that you knew how to keep from recontaminating somebody else. So have a storage for yourself. But you, you almost certainly can't afford storage enough to take all the water off your roof. Put it back in the well. After it's. Uh, after it's Filled well enough. Okay, well, I'll talk to you separately about it. What actually is a, a, a spring? Is that coming directly from the aquifer? Uh, well, uh, easy way to think about it. It, has to, it doesn't come up automatically. Uh -huh. There has to be some higher ground of it somewhere. It's got to have a pressure head. So somewhere or other, there's got to be pressure on it. Huh. 
And so usually a spring is uh, in, the, in the hillside uh, where above there's groundwater infiltrating the ground and being collected in some channel and it happens to come out in one particular place and it's a spring. It could be sometimes they're very distant. You don't realize not a hill on your property, it's a hill somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But I don't, to my knowledge, there aren't anything like these pressurized geysers or petroleum we used to read about when they have blew up. I don't think there's anything like that. I think there almost always has to be something uphill. Which gave me a chance to mention one thing I hadn't mentioned before. When I started around, I was very impressed with something called a Kwanah. Um, that's the uh, Persian word. I keep forgetting Arabic when there's another one, uh, another one for it. But a Kwanah is essentially uh, the, uh, the opposite of what you said about infiltration. It's a rain garden that collects water high in the mountains and then a pipe from there down to the city. So essentially they intercept the underground water way up high, and they, since they're, it's high, they have plenty of pressure. That's why there's fountains in the middle of the desert. There's no water there. You know, they're pumping there. Even, even without wells, there's no water there. Uh, the Quanat system is spread throughout the Middle East. And actually, I, one of the things that sort of kicks me off, we have a perfect place for a Quanat system right here in the UCSC. Mm -hmm. It would not be very expensive compared to most water supplies because you, we have pipes. The Quanats, they go. 2,000, 1,500 years ago were very expensive. They didn't have pipes. But we have pipes. It's a simple way to do it. Uh, Nancy Abrams, who got me in this group, uh, wrote the chancellor and suggested that he hear my ideas about the plan. And I wrote him and he sent it on the facilities and he died. Uh, they probably prefer to the same thing. I probably some prefer it much more of a sexy thing to build a new parking garage than it is to have an underground uh, infiltration something a mile away and some pipes. It doesn't make nearly a big spread and uh, you don't get as many corner offices or the corner wings in your office if you, uh, if you just build something like that that's so low tech, no pumps, no nothing, just water flowing out of it, not very fast. If it flows all day long, it has to flow very fast. So we can, we can't be, it's not practical for everywhere in Santa Cruz County, but it just so happens there's a hillside behind UCSC within a mile or so. I don't know the exact spot you'd want to build one, but you could use it off on UCSC land and it would cost some money, but it wouldn't be anything like a, a water supply that you might imagine. So, I uh, have someone else had a question? Oh, I have one. Yes. Kind of a crazy question, but um, you were talking about like, one of called the stops or um, check dams. Yes. Um, what would happen if they put some sort of major stop thing or just real stop to flow where the, the margarita, where the margarita goes into the ocean? Well, it would work, would but do it? well, the thing about that is, first of all, it's much more expensive to build. It would have to be a concrete dam. Have to go quite a bit deep. And my experience that um, I wouldn't do it myself out of a concrete, even if somebody paid me for it. What I've done is something similar. I might use redwood logs. Redwood logs would not be impermeable. Water would still go through all kinds of cracks, but it would serve as a check dam. And the, and the advantages are resilient. I like concrete as an engineer. I design things with concrete all the time. But when water can go around it, they can always find a way to undermine it. And as no matter how massive you make a concrete wall, yes. the water gets underneath it, it'll fall over. But wouldn't that um, stop some of the salt intrusion and also raise our water table? That, it would certainly do it as long as it should. Now, I'm just saying there are better ways to do it than use a concrete wall. Yeah. But, uh, but the, check, the check dams I mentioned uh, accomplish the same thing. Suppose Peter put, instead of one expensive wall, he put in four check dams in his spare time. Are they are they doing that now? People do check dams where they've got aware of it. They, there are many check dams used in the Midwest. After the drought period, the um, Bureau of Land Management or something paid for check dams all over the country because you've seen those pictures of the terrible erosion. That's what he's talking about. That's what the check dams were for. They didn't even, I don't think they even thought about the infiltration. It's just that they slowed the water down so it didn't carve willies. Do you think it would work for the Santa I uh, guess, well, if you can get the water just percolated in the ground, it will, of course, get there. And I'm, 
our particular project with the churches, um, it's almost certainly would help the Soquel wells two miles away. You know, help the San Cruz Water Department would help the Quakers, but it would two miles away. Their wells would be better, and it would prevent. She mentioned something um, probably you all heard of. Seawater intrusion is a very serious problem. If you if you if you're close to the river, the ocean, and you pull your freshwater aquifer down far enough, well, seawater can come back the other way. And once it gets in there, it, just, it really can't, it changes chemically in some way, so many kinds of soil. So it's almost irreversible. Nothing's totally irreversible, but it's that. So it, it, would, it would work, but check dams, I think, are a more efficient way to do it. Of course, you've got a small lot, you don't have room for check dams, or many of them. Uh, so what do you mean by that? I checked them just to slow the water down. If it slows down, then it will have time to infiltrate. Oh, so you wouldn't have to do it right where... You wouldn't have to do one big dam. If you just have a series of small dams, all of them would leak. Water would go through them to the next one, to the next one. It would keep your land from eroding, and it also would infiltrate much more because the water is still longer. It's simply no matter how long it's there. How, do you, how far down do you have to get those logs? I, you know, it's like storage, whatever you can afford. I'm not serious about that. If you if you could build some elaborate structure and get it real deep and work better, but we're checked in generally are very low tech plans. You've got some extra logs in your property, you've got some extra twigs. Just make sure they don't float downstream and anchor them somehow and make a little dam. It'll be any won't stop all water, you won't see pools behind it. But it will cause more infiltration and it will prevent erosion. Yes. You presented a nice summary of the problems with various water saving techniques. What do you think are actually are the best suggestions for Santa Cruz County? For Santa Cruz uh, area, I think the best suggestion is that we encourage rainwater collection roofs in areas in small neighborhoods. It, it, it is inordinately expensive for an individual to do it. It's, your roofs are there, but your gutters are there, but you still need the tank and need all kinds of things. I made a calculation for that once, and it was someplace somewhat like this. It was on a cul-de-sac, and I thought about 10 houses was just about 100 houses too many, but 10 houses, a lot of rainfall on 10 houses in the pavement in front of them. You could build one big tank underneath the cul-de-sac and repave it, so you have the tank there, enough water for all that you collect from all 10 houses. Uh, the reason I make a point, it, it's not scalable very easily to 100 houses or 1,000 houses. You can have many of them. It's again the same thing about decentralization. Ten people with their capital resources can have a very efficient rainfall collection and storage system. It gets to be 100 too far away. You know, the, the piping costs and the, all kinds of things. So it's not a hard and fast number. I just have to do it for 10. It can be done, and I would think the best thing for us, if you can afford it, go on your own house. Now, the problem usually is that there are tanks that are not very expensive. But very, unless you have a very large lot, you're not likely to have a big ugly tank in the middle of your lot. Mm -hmm. So, and you put them underground, which is far better, it's a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. So, anybody can afford it. You save all the rainfall you can. Every, every bit you save does two things. It's for you, and it cuts down on the stormwater runoff. So, so right now our water from our treatment plant goes into the ocean. So my question is, is there a significant amount of water? We don't use it now because I assume it's expensive, but in the long term is that a feasible water source for us, for taking our treated water and, and using it for agriculture or something like that? I think the number I've seen is very feasible. They're just political difficulties. And there were some water rights difficulties. To answer your question, there's enough water in the wintertime that we, we wouldn't want to put it in our own aquifer. We don't even use aquifer. We don't have any wells in Santa Cruz County, in, in the Santa Cruz City area. Mm -hmm. But there was a tentative deal with Soquel to send that treated water in the wintertime in excess of our own needs to them for them to feed their people. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, and I think this is in the sticking point, we're giving them water at some cost all winter long. Mm -hmm. Then when a drought comes, they're to, they're to repay us with water out of their 